I am so excited for my guest on this segment. She is Nikita Ren Thigpen, who helps exhausted power couples and married women entrepreneurs reconnect with their forever love and amplify intimacy. When they find themselves sacrificing their relationships because they're so consumed with the wild success they're experiencing in a business. As an international best-selling author of the book Selfish, keynote speaker, podcast host, and CEO, Nikita's equipped countless high-profile women and a few brave men with the tools to recalibrate their power dynamics, redefine their romance, and close the love gap to achieve whole success. Welcome, Nikita. How are you doing today? I am absolutely magical and so grateful to be here with you because you know I love, uh, love, love your energy. So thank oh you, Oh my Monica. goodness. So <laughs> fun. So fun. Well, that was your professional fancy intro, but what would you really like viewers to know about you? Yeah. So I'm a licensed clinical social worker by background. I'm rooted as a trauma specialist for the last 25 plus years before I became an entrepreneur literally 10 years ago. Now that I think about the date that we're recording this. Part of the the longevity and the history of what I've done has always been rooted in just wanting to understand human behavior at its finest, why people connect both physically as well as spiritually, because we know love is way more than just the physical, oh, they a dime piece type moments. Um, and because of that, I got deeper into sexology and really working with power couples who wanted more than just wild successful businesses. They wanted to prioritize their families. Oh, I love it. You know, we are so, so aligned. So happy to have you here. So for the time we have together, I would really love for you to talk about some common intimacy blocks and your process for reverse engineering those blocks. Thank you. Uh, some, there's quite a few intimacy blocks, but some of the ones that most people listening and watching this will be familiar with are when you blame each other for intimacy not happening, when you expect that it's just going to happen. These are all intimacy blocks, superficial co communication. How was your day? Fine. What do you want to do? Anything, you know, like those kind of comments and responses. When we hide behind our devoted time to our children, our elder care responsibilities, our, our work, um, ministerial duties, you know, to your church or synagogue or wherever it is that you potentially volunteer, when you start to hide behind those activities as these are the reasons I'm too busy to make room for building with my boo, <laughs> you know, when you do that, these are all intimacy blocks, as well as when you start to really treat each other in ways you would never want to be treated. It, you know, pulling back affirmations from each other. Maybe I'm just going to make it up and say 10 years ago when you first fell in love or first really started to connect, you would say things like, I appreciate that or thank you or your eyes are glowing today or oh, look at your skin. And now you just keep moving towards the business of, did you pay that bill? Well, the plumber's coming today. The electrician needs to come, you know, let's get on the same schedule, but you're not actually fulfilling each other by appreciating and validating. Those are just some of the few. Awesome. So you named some really good kind of emotional intimacy blocks, but well, let's say one of the viewers is sitting here thinking, I totally do that. I don't mean to, I've just gotten really busy and, you know, being physically, emotionally, or even sexually intimate with my partner is the last thing on my mind. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they're recognizing some of those blocks that you were just speaking about. What are some tips and tricks that you would advise these viewers to start implementing to maybe reverse engineer those things? Yeah, that's a, a really good question, Monica, because there's, and to your kind of other behind the scenes part of your question, like when there's some physical blocks, like smothering each other, that's an intimacy block. Like it sounds opposite of having a block in intimacy when you're always together, but too much togetherness is smothering. And when we think about coming out of a pit, hopefully coming fully out of a pandemic from 2020 and people uh, had challenges with intimacy because they literally were always together that it created intimacy blocks because there was too much proximity. Where prior to 2020's COVID pandemic, you know, outburst, if you will, we had buffers. We could go out to the store, out to work, out to tennis, take the kids to a park. We had some buffers and then could come back and miss each other. So part of the reverse engineering of intimacy 
blocks is very similar. It's literally identical to how I help a lot of the fast scaling women I work with deal with a lot of the imposter syndrome and reverse it. You have to acknowledge it. You cannot ignore that it's happening, right? So the first step is truly acknowledge it, call it out. I hear you. I see you. I see what's happening in my relationship. And if you're on the imposter syndrome way, which men, those brave men can have imposter syndrome too. I just realized I just said women, but those are pretty much the people that we work with individually besides having them together as a couple, but just call it out. All right. I, I see what it is. This is what's happening. This is how it's interrupting my life. This is how it's impacting me. These are the pains that it's causing in my relationship. I'm getting FOMO when I'm flipping through Instagram and looking at relationship goals for other people's lives and not feeling the same for myself. We're sitting on opposite ends of the couch in the same place, letting the TV watch us and calling that date night you know, things like that, like call it out for what it is. So acknowledging it is the very first step. And as a clinician and therapist, it's the first step for everything. You have to have awareness that you have an issue in the first place. And then you want to normalize it. I'm not the only human in the world that has not liked her husband, <laughs> right? Like who has not been liked as a wife, who has not wanted to be physically, emotionally, creatively intimate with the person that is my forever love because I'm exhausted or I'm empty inside or there's a gap coming up. Like normalize what's happening so you don't feel like the strange one. Because once we start doing things like that and ostracizing ourselves, we start treating ourselves very unkindly. We start to shame ourselves and we start to be more secretive about what it is that we're dealing with, which does lead to depression and anxiety and many, many other things. You think about when you're shame eating, you start to hide. You don't eat less, you eat more. When you're shame loving, you don't love someone in a, a very moderate way that it leaves room for you. You end up focusing all of your energy on them and it could look real legitimately like obsession, right? Like when you think about the high school versions of you and some of the things you did when you felt like you had to hide and shame. So you're just being mindful of that and normalize it. Like let's shake the shame and normalize that. When you normalize though, make sure that you don't normalize it to a point where you say, oh, well, I mean, this is just what it is. This is the seven year itch. This is the 10, right? Like this is, this is what happens when you've been with someone for 20 some years. So what? Normal isn't necessary. Normal is normal, but normal isn't necessary. It's normal to be hateful. It's normal to be uh, small-minded, right? It's normal for you to do those things, but is it necessary for you to be hateful to other people or hateful to yourself or unkind? No, it's not necessary. So once you normalize it, before we can get into the actual reversal process, we got to be willing to say like, yeah, I know that this is how my sister's marriage is, my parents' marriage was, my grandparents, but is it necessary for me to repeat the same thing? So what, I'm in my second or third marriage. There's no shame there. It might've took you a couple of rodeos to figure out how to stay up on the horse that you wanted to stay up on versus feeling like you had to ride the one that was giving to you at 19 or 20 or whenever you first got into your, I'll call it your first infatuation. There's no shame in that, but you do wanna normalize making something that is new for you, your new way versus being in the old belief system or the old traditions of how other people in your family or in proximity of you know your family or your friend circle have been and thought like, oh, it's fine. I'm on my third divorce too. All right. I'm not judging, but that doesn't have to be my normal just because a few of my friends have that, right? Normal isn't necessary. So reversing is really similar to what we do in imposter syndrome when you have a lot of those thoughts of I'm not good enough. I can't do this. I don't know why someone would think I'm ready for this. You know, some of those subconscious things that start to come up when you're suffering with imposter syndrome, which by the way, for anyone watching this, I don't care how much money you have how many accolades you have, how many accomplishments you've created over 10, 15, 20 years, you can go through imposter syndrome at every new level of your greatness, period. Every time you create a new program, a new project, a new summit, you know, anything, you can go through a cycle of this. And this is a way to reverse it. You get faster and it gets easier which each each time and you start to have it less and less. It's the same with reversing the intimacy blocks that come up. 
you acknowledged it, you normalized it, you know it's not necessary. And now you're, you're looking at it like, okay, if I were to have someone who was struggling with imposter syndrome right now saying to myself, well, I don't think I'm good enough for this. I don't think I'm ready. We reverse it by saying, I am good enough. I am ready right now. Like you literally reverse the language and reframe it. It gets real geeky and we can get into like neuroscience and like what that does for our neurotransmitters to like create a new synapsis every time we say something that is powerful, that we feel energetically and we create all of our senses around it to really staple it and, you know, immerse it into our brain. But basically that's what we're doing. We're creating new habits for ourselves and new ways of thinking when we reverse it. So when you have that intimacy block of hiding, as an example, behind all of the work duties and all of the childcare duties and elder care, whatever else that you're so busy doing, creating your wildly successful life, that you feel like you just don't have energy and time to prioritize your intimacy with your forever lover. When that's coming up, the way you reverse it is you look at your schedule and say, oh, I see, I don't have time because I didn't schedule time. Huh, I made that client appointment because it was an appointment on my calendar. Well, you can put sex as an appointment on your calendar too. I know a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to have to do that, but it's building a muscle. Eventually, you don't have to schedule with your trainer to get the workout in. You do it in the beginning because you need accountability. You schedule these things because you need accountability. I have all of my power couple clients schedule shower time. You start with once a week, build up. And the shower play doesn't have to be, you know, full on deep penetration, right? It's just an opportunity to be naked, to feel good with each other, to go through the insecurities with each other, knowing you're in a safe space and create that safety with each other to bring you together. It's awkward and weird if you haven't looked at your lover's body in the daylight with water running over it in a really long time, right? It's just weird because we haven't done it in so long. Once you start to do it, it becomes normal you start having conversations, you start talking to each other, you start to get, instead of standing on opposite ends of the shower, you start getting closer, you start touching and petting and whatever else happens in the magic under that water faucet, so be it. Like that, these are some of the things that happen when you put yourself in a proximity that you can control to reverse the space of, I don't have time. You create the time by scheduling and building the muscle. Eventually, you don't have to schedule anymore eventually you won't be able to keep your hands off of each other. And then you start sending whoever your balance and relationship advisor is or your marriage coach and such, you start sending messages like, girl, I don't know what you did to us, but we cannot stop touching to each other. You know what I mean? Like you get into that space because you now have a new habit programmed because you've reversed it. But in order to get through all of those top three things, you have to do the fourth thing, which is to seal it in. You have to seal it in with action. This can't be something that you bought the treadmill, but you never use it. You, and you schedule the, the time with your lover for puzzle play, date night, walk through the park, shower time, whatever it is, but then you actually ignore the calendar notification because all you're doing is rewarding yourself with inaction that's telling your brain, which is there to keep you safe. It's telling your brain that this is okay. This is what I wanna do. And there's no reason to do anything else. He's fine, they'll be all right, it, it's good. You know, they'll, they'll stick with me forever anyway. Yeah, they will. And you'll eventually become roommates that literally are two passing ships in the night that have no passion. You're not interested in intimacy. And there may not be a risk of infidelity or any of those particular things, but there's a risk of you now having a mundane, mediocre relationship that doesn't bring you joy. So you start to look for more joy outside of your marriage, hiding deeper behind those intimacy blocks with more work, more busyness, more fires that you have to put out. And instead of spending time with the person that hopefully creates sacred you know, safety for you, that when all the work goes away, because at some point in our 60s, our 70s, our 80s, at some point, you're going to slow down, God willing, if you're here with breath in your body to do so. And you're going to want someone to spend that time with, but you're going to look over to the other side of the couch. And if that person is there, you're not going to recognize each other anymore. You're not going to know each other. So we have to start 
this process of reversing it now and getting uncomfortable, doing the awkward things like scheduling sex, scheduling shower play, scheduling time for foot massages. Like you're going to have to do that if the busyness is one of your bigger intimacy blocks that you're challenged with. So good. So good. That's fantastic. So let's go through your four steps again, real quick, just to summarize, because I thought those were so well taught. We're going to number one, recognize it. Yep. Acknowledge. Acknowledge mm-hmm. and recognize it. Number two, normalize it. Yes. And realize that normal does not have to be necessary. Exactly. So just because it's a story of a lot of people around you doesn't mean it has to be your story. So That's I right. loved, loved that. Thank you. And then number three, we've got to break it, right? We've got to come up with some action. Well, we want to reverse it with reverse statements. It. Mm-hmm. Reverse St- it with statements and action. Mm-hmm. And number four, seal it in. Seal it in. And that's the deeper action when you start to get repetitive and consistent. Thank you for clarifying that too. Consistency wins everything. It helps you build the discipline muscle. And it actually helps to take those things that were awkward and uncomfortable at one time. They become something that you look forward to do forward to doing right like you start looking at like oh this is fun like like we went from being really weird about spending time with each other and having which might it might actually start with just 10 minutes right 10 minutes of time to have coffee tea whatever it is that you do in the morning just for that space building up to maybe a 20 minute shower play building up to an hour uh, once a week to work on a puzzle or do some mandala or, you know, play some cards or something like that, that eventually leads to you being able to actually have a vacation that isn't about the kids' activities or, you know, creating all the things that you have to do to stay busy on vacation because you don't really know how to be with each other. The consistency is the seal and making sure this isn't a one and done, like, oh, Nikita, we tried that a couple of times. It didn't work. Well, of course not. You're still in the awkward, uncomfortable, harder phase of it. You're in the the space of, I don't really want to meet with this personal trainer. It takes about six to 12 sessions before you actually start to look forward to meeting your personal trainer. It's going to take about the same amount of time for you to build that new rapport with this way of being that you want versus you falling sway to all the ways that you were. You really have to move forward. Oh, I love that building consistency. Thank you so, so much for that. I hope that people will really take that to heart. And so I want to ask you a more personal question. Let's yeah. imagine that one day you wake up and realize that you've allowed life, kids, grandkids, business, and all of the things to take precedence over your partner. And you're feeling really disconnected and a huge rut in your relationship. I want to know what you personally, Nikita, would do to rebuild your relationship, reignite the smart spark, and bring the fun back into your partnership. I have learned to not guess with my husband. We've been together, we've friends since 13, together since 17. So it's been a long time. I know I look young and I have great skin, but we've been together a really long time with adult children and grandbabies to your question. Uh, not guessing, I would ask him, how can I support you? Like, what is it that you want more of or less of? Probably less of, he would probably say, I need you to stop talking so much because I'm verbal, as I'm sure you've figured out at this point. I'm really verbal all the time because I'm a processor. So I think and I talk out loud as I'm processing and it doesn't matter who's in the house or who's not in the house when I'm doing it. Uh, But listening, and literally allowing that space for it. He takes time to think about his answers. And I'm like a jump in, like, let's go, let's get it. So I, my old self would have taken his lack of, you know, quick answer as a, all right, well, you don't know what to do. Well, let me schedule a vacation and do this and do that, you know, and do all the things, which might be interesting, but not what he wanted and not what he needs. And I have learned that seeing my husband, hearing him, fully, which means on his time, like hearing him out when he's ready to talk, is a version of appreciating and validating him, which is really important. And you and I've talked about that before, about appreciating and validating and edifying as part of the way that you desire that you're forever lover in a new way. So for me, it's just asking, how can I support you? How can we make this new or different and 
revitalize our relationship together. So good. All right, Nikita, this has been fantastic. Tell viewers how they can best find you. Let us know all the good things. Yeah. So the first good thing I would say is go to our website, thinkpro.com. I'm sure all the links will be below. You'll have access to like to book an appointment, to get some clarity on where you are in your relationship, if that's something you want as a power couple. Uh, we also have a free Facebook private group called Certified Selfish because it's a little playoff of the book that I also encourage people to go and get. It is not a how-to so I will warn you now, it is a survivor's memoir and a personal transformation story. Talk about getting personal, Monica. I go all the way in 209 pages of pure truth, even the heavy stuff and even the not so good parts of our relationship and our marriage all the way through. Uh, so I would definitely encourage you to go to Amazon, Barnes and Nobles. It's at 400,000 bookstores nationwide, internationally actually. So pick it up anywhere you choose. Perfect. Well, that will be linked below as well as the website. So thank you so much, Nikita. Thank you. To learn more ways to deepen your intimacy and strengthen your relationship, make sure you watch this video next.